Good evening and welcome to our Good Friday service. My name is Lynn McLernan. I'm pastoral assistant here at Pompey Community Church and we're really glad that you've joined us tonight. Good Friday is our opportunity to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. It can be a sobering night in many ways because we're going to be talking about Jesus' death and his suffering. But it's important to remember that unless there is justice, God's justice through the cross, we can't have his mercy. And unless there's death, we can't know his resurrection. So tonight we're going to worship the Lord. We are going to read from scripture. We're going to take some moments of silence uh, to reflect on what Jesus did and where the goodness of God is in it for us, each of us, individually and corporately. And then we're going to have, share communion together, just an ultimate response to God's love and generosity to us. So our prayer tonight is that you will grow closer to our Lord and experience in deeper ways his amazing and immense love, his abundant forgiveness, um, and his everlasting and amazing grace. So thank you. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was laid. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown on the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it through dark Calvary. Cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Tennant. I'm ministry coordinator at Pompey Community Church, and it's my privilege to read from God's Word tonight. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 through 54, on the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to to drink mingled with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And they put up above his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we shall believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers also, who had been crucified with him, were casting the same insult at him. Now, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake, and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now I'd like to go uh, back into our reading and take a closer look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. And the following ex excerpt is from the day 30 of our Lenten devotional called Journeying with Jesus. What a dramatic moment. The curtain of the temple was torn into two. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the worshipers was a heavy piece of fabric. According to historical accounts, it was 45 to 60 feet long and about four inches thick. This was not a flimsy strip of material and is split from top to bottom. 
The tearing of the curtain was supernatural, and it pointed to the fact that Jesus' death gives us, a broken and sinful humanity, the right to come into the Holy of Holies and have a relationship with God. Maybe we should ask ourselves what kind of curtains or veils we hide behind. What stops us from entering into an intimate communion with God? Could it be that my past is too murky? Or that I first need to get things in order? Could the curtain be that I'm still in love with all the things of the world? Well, we need to believe that the curtain has already been torn. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20 say that the faithful enter into the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the veil, that is, through his flesh. Jesus' flesh was torn so all could enter that innermost sanctuary. As long as we want to keep the curtain closed, we will never be able to see the beauty of the Lord. So, let's take a few moments to silently reflect on the following two questions. The first one is, what curtain do I hide behind? The second one is, what keeps me from fully accepting that Jesus knows me completely and loves me unconditionally? Now, let's take a closer look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. This excerpt is from day 31 of our Lenten devotional. The magnitude of Jesus' crucifixion was reflected in nature. Darkness covered the land. The earth shook violently. Rocks split. There's no way anyone who witnessed this could have put all these signs down to coincidence. Nature was echoing the utter devastation of the moment. The centurion and his cronies gasped in terror finally recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God. But recognizing that fact and putting one's faith in Jesus are two entirely different things. In fact, even Satan recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God. What you do with that acknowledgement is what determines your life here and forever. Nature testifies to the glorious power of God. In Romans 1, Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So let's not stop at exclaiming, surely he was the Son of God. Let's say with delight that surely he is my God. Again, let's take a few moments to silently reflect on the following two questions as we prepare our hearts to celebrate communion together. First one, what am I doing with my knowledge of God? Secondly, is it changing the way I live? Lord Jesus, thank you for your amazing love that you were willing to come down from heaven to live on the earth and then to die a horrible death on the cross. And you did that because you love us so much and you wanted to take our sins from us upon yourself that by us being able to believe in you, we could have our sins forgiven and then be able to know for sure that we can live in heaven with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. So we thank you for this chance today to focus on these things and reflect on you and your goodness. Help us to make that decision to follow you as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When peace like a river attends
It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet. Though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul. My Hey, PCC Church family, we're so glad that you can join us. I'm here with my wife, Ray, here. And today we are going to come uh, at that part of our service where we're going to partake of communion. And so I know this is unique. This is the first time I've ever virtually taken communion online. And so if you have bread and some grape juice, um, we're going to use this time now to remember uh, that wonderful and incredible work that Christ accomplished for us 2,000 years ago. As Jesus told us, the bread represents his broken body and the grape juice represents the blood that he shed for us. This table is an object lesson. It is just an outward testimony of an inward reality that Christ has done in our life. And just as we eat of the bread and as we are about to take of the grape juice and remembering what Christ has done for us on the cross, we are declaring his, his death, burial, and resurrection in our own life. But the tragedy of all tragedies would be if you just simply let these elements be just symbols, just be regular things that pass you by and yet not have made that personal decision in your heart 
uh, to make Jesus your Lord and Savior of your life. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And in this prayer, if this is the first time uh, that you are coming in to know Christ, then you could just repeat the words after me. And then I'm going to read the passage of Scripture, and then we're going to take of the bread and the grape juice. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the work that you have done for us just 2,000 years ago, Lord. We could not even begin to express in words the gratitude and the thanks that we have for what you have done for us, Lord. God, I pray, Father, that you uh, would come into our lives and that you would help us to walk with you, Lord. Father, I'm tired of running after uh, my own goals and my own desires, Lord. I want to follow you, Lord. I am truly and sincerely sorry for the sins that I have committed against you, Lord. And I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are Lord and that you are King. And God, I ask that you would come into my life now, Father, and that you would make me into a child of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Make us into the image of your Son, Lord. We love you and we thank you, God, and we ask all these things. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Now, if that's your first time you've ever made a prayer like that, then I would invite you to participate with the rest of us in, in the church family to take of some bread that you may have of your in your house or in some grape juice and then reflect on what God has done for you through his son, Jesus, on that cross. So let me read our passage now. It says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, we thank you all for those of you who could join us, and we're so excited to be worshiping with you this Sunday morning. God bless y'all. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for what you did for us, Lord, that day on the cross, the whole passion leading up to your crucifixion, Lord. You died for our sins, Lord. I don't know where I would be, Lord, without the cross. I don't know where I would be. Well, we wait in joyful and hopeful anticipation of celebrating your conquering the grave on Sunday morning, Lord. And we know the story. We know that the cross was not the end of the story, Lord. We know and we believe, and that is our hope and our joy. But we pray, Lord, that you help us to never look past the cross, Lord, never to take it for granted, never to miss the opportunity to reflect and to be grateful for that amazing form of worship, that amazing sacrifice, that amazing thing you did for me, Lord, and for all of us. So we, we worship you right now, Lord. We pray to you. We love you, Jesus.
Lord Jesus, we love you, we worship you, and with grateful hearts we sing your praises. Please bless us as we go from here, Lord, and help us to reflect over the next couple of days on the amazing gift of your life, Lord, and salvation through you, Jesus, as we celebrate on Sunday, Easter, and the resurrection. So just bless us, Lord, and we love you. And everybody said together, Amen. Thank you, everybody, for worshiping with us this evening. Our prayer is that you go from here and you continue 
to pray and reflect upon um, Good Friday and all, all that it means. And until we see each other again on Sunday morning, God bless you. We love you. Have a great evening.